Hey, I'm Mac. Welcome back to my channel. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon for access to new videos 12 to 24 hours early, as well as some Patreon exclusive content. Self-help author and generalized rah-rah guru, Rachel Suck It Till You Fuck It Hollis, has just completed a nationwide tour, sort of, depending on how fast and loose you're willing to play it with the definition of nationwide. Yeah, this was the first fully alive event from her since the beginning of the pandemic, sort of. And all signs and indicators are pointing at it being a colossal flop. We'll get to the details of that later, but first, I thought this would be a great opportunity to review the overall timeline of Hollisville because in order to know how far she's fallen, we need to know how high she climbed. See, that's called vertical drop. That's a ski term because I am ready for ski season. Are the lifts spinning yet? Are the lifts spinning? I have been asking that since June, okay? I'm a white guy in Utah who loves Fleetwood Mac and is excited for ski season. I'm different. So get ready, grab a snack, because damn your love, damn your lies, let's go! I'm not interested in Rachel Hollis's childhood because frankly, we don't really know what, to what degree what she says about it is true. It's not as if her father can just come out and say, my daughter is a liar and look like the good guy. We're going to skip ahead to the relevant portions because the point of this video is to compare where she is now with where she was. Rachel got a theater scholarship to go to college in Los Angeles and at the age of 17, she moved there from her family home in Weed Patch, California. Yes, that is the same Weed Patch that is in Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, a novel which was banned in Kern County, California from 1939 to 1941, in which a watchman at a labor camp explains, any preacher can preach in this camp, nobody can take up a collection in this camp. And it was kind of sad for the old folks, because there hasn't been a preacher in since. Recalling when, in response to the Holy Roller Pentecostal preachers like Rachel's family coming through, the committee of the camp banned taking up collections. Rachel secured a paid internship that became a ticket to a full-time job at Miramax by the time she turned 18, at which point, having secured full-time employment, she decided she was done with school, uh, all of which I'm sure is a function of how much harder she worked than we do, um, and completely unrelated to the economy finally beginning to collapse irreparably as the duct tape holding it together under the strain of Reagan-era policies that annihilated the American dream permanently, but uh, hey, at least they took care of those welfare queens, a concept which definitely refers to a real phenomenon and is not just some made-up racist story fabricated to make racist white people angry so they'll vote for you even though you are in the process of gleefully annihilating the futures of their children to whom the very concept of securing full-time employment from an internship will sound so ludicrous that it inspires laughter and incredulity that such a thing used to be possible. Miramax was also where she met Dave Hollis, whose financial resources, I'm sure, had nothing to do with her ability to start her event planning business, Chic Events, the same year that she and Dave got married in 2004. Clearly, she was extremely adept at the business because it was wildly successful, and in Hollywood, no less. I'm sure that was incredibly stressful. They will rip your face off. In 2008, Rachel was named in the Inc.com 30 Under 30 at number 28 for Chic Events, which was listed as having revenue of $750,000. Says Inc.com, all she needed was a computer, a phone line, and an intern, which kept startup costs down. Love that. As we all know, the purpose of an intern is to keep startup costs down on your later wildly profitable business, not to provide a learning experience or anything. Why pay employees when you can take advantage of our predatory higher education bubble? According to an article by Kelly Damien on Bakersfield.com, clients included Rashida Jones, Al Gore, and Bradley Cooper. Her blog presence started off on MyChicLife.com, and I'm going to read the entire About Rachel section to you as it appeared in 2011 because I find it fascinating fascinating how she presents herself. Quote, I am Rachel Elizabeth Hollis, a wife, a mother, a Southern girl, an LA woman, and for all intents and purposes, event and wedding planner extraordinaire. Rachel, Southern girl, you're from Weed Patch, California. Your family is from Oklahoma. You are literally not a Southern girl, no matter how much you stretch the truth to its limit. I love parties. I love everything about them. I love the food, the wine, having friends and family and people from all walks of life together in one well-decorated space. 
I love giving people something to get excited about. I love themes and cocktail napkins and finding the perfect platter to display the turkey. I love all of these things because everyone I love loves them too. Jesus. I don't know anyone who doesn't like a good party. And if there are people out there who don't, maybe that's because you haven't been to one of mine. I am not a debutante. I didn't grow up with money and entertaining wasn't even part of the vernacular until I became an adult. I am a preacher's daughter, the baby of four, and ever the entertainer. I'm sure I came out of the womb talking or doing some type of tap dance. Growing up, our family didn't refer to it as entertaining. We just always had people over, always had parties, always made the biggest, fattest deal out of every holiday and birthday. I believe a lot of that has to do with Southern hospitality. Rachel, for the love of God, you are from Kern County, California. Southern hospitality does not mean Southern California hospitality. Seriously, what is it with your desperation to be perceived as being from the South? It is so weird. I always find it so interesting when you can find evidence of a way that someone wishes to be perceived that is at odds with the facts. It tells you a lot about someone's more inner desires in a weird way. But regardless of how much or little money we had, everyone was always welcome. We weren't the Bradys, far from it. In fact, my parents divorced when I was a teenager. But those Christmases, those barbecues, those anniversary parties are the most precious moments of my childhood. Even the ones with boxed cake mix. It is how I learned to show love, by cooking, by baking, by welcoming guests into our home, by setting the table with the best china. Even on a random weeknight, there was always place for celebration. Okay, what? Your family had china? That's, I don't know. At least you used it, I guess. Some families, for whatever reason, have a set of fine china that they never use, which is absolutely insane to me. A set of china that cannot be used for eating is is worthless, is like a worthless object. Fine china is supposed to be used for serving food. That's its purpose. It's for enhancing a meal's presentation through its high quality. It should be enjoyed. If you can't use it, then it's not fit for its intended purpose and you should get rid of it. If you think it's worth so much, why don't you try selling it and let me know how that goes, okay? Why are you holding on to something that you can't use? It's so stupid. So props to Rachel's family for actually using it for its intended purpose, I guess. I started Chic Events in January of 2004, and truthfully, I was anything but chic at the time. But I believe chic is the pursuit of the fabulous, about wanting to be something greater than you are, more beautiful inside and out, and to live a glamorous life. Even if some days that might just mean putting the takeout on a real plate before you eat it. I believe that as a society, this art of entertaining, of perfectly chilled martinis and beautifully crafted centerpieces has been lost and forgotten. Clients will pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars to help them plan the party of their dreams, but they won't dare attempt it themselves. I suppose, like anything else, if you didn't grow up doing this, it might seem daunting and impossible. Doesn't it doesn't this seem like it is in stark contrast to the way she talks about her childhood in Girl Wash Your Face? I realize that families can be complex and complicated with multiple story arcs happening at once, and that any consistent, simple thread drawn from it is usually being imposed by whoever's telling the story, but it's just odd. But I think if you're willing to give it a try to roll up your sleeves, put on your vintage apron, and to throw back a vodka tonic for courage, of course, and make an attempt to flex your hosting muscles, you'll be surprised how capable you really are. Girl, drinking a vodka LaCroix is not courage. Courage is facing down your alcohol dependence and walking away from it. This is actually a relatively dangerous pattern of alcohol use because you're self-medicating with it and you absolutely will find yourself believing it to be helpful in more and more and more situations at higher and higher doses as your anxiety and alcohol withdrawal frolic through your brain, holding hands and bonding over their mutual love of neurological arson in their own little rom-com. 
Now, make no mistake, this was not just Rachel all by herself writing her little blog all by her lonesome. My Chic Life had multiple contributors, including actual interns. I'm not about to let Rachel get away with spinning it as if she's just like everybody else, just some nobody blogging her heart out at the kitchen table, please. So the types of content she posted were basically what you'd expect. The site is divided into several sections. There's eat which is recipes that people will read and think about maybe making someday, but will definitely never make like overnight sweet pickles or maple flank steak. Girl, in this economy, then there's the drink section, which is essentially an alarming number of cocktail recipes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but cocktails are just you pretending to be sophisticated about your liquor consumption. I mean, how can you be an alcoholic while sipping a birthday cake martini? Completing the phrase, there's be merry, which is centerpieces and party ideas that everyone will definitely think about doing but never follow through on. There's also a more catch-all miscellaneous section called the Daily Chic which includes a lot of more general mommy bloggish content like relationship advice, which is fantastic. I mean, how Rachel Hollis ever thought herself qualified on that topic is beyond me. Even if Rachel and Dave were still married and in a perfect relationship, the fact that she got it right on her first try sort of means she's never had to know what getting it wrong looks like and what you're supposed to do when that happens. Of course, with hindsight, we know they did get it wrong, and it took a very long time to finally admit it. Oh, oh, and there's a post here where she confesses that she got a boob job in 2013, which is much earlier than I had assumed it was. And she remarks that she's embarrassed that the doctors and other providers will see her boobs, and she hopes that the male anesthesiologist is, quote, overweight, nearsighted, or has some terrible facial deformity at the very least unquote, which is very on brand for her. I will mention that the doctor she went to is in Beverly Hills and a breast lift from this doctor starts at $24,000. This was before Girl Wash Your Face, $24,000. Yeah, so <laughs> in, late, in late 2013, she published her first novel, Party Girl, despite Dave saying that it had a 3% chance of happening. And in response to that, Rachel would get a 3% chance bracelet custom made so that her spitefulness could be worn as a fashion accessory. So, you know, both partners here really just displaying behaviors that are indicative of a healthy relationship that everyone else should totally emulate. She wrote two more novels and two cookbooks in the next few years. The next big break in Rachel's rise to fame came in March of 2015 when a post she made on Instagram went viral. In the photo, she is wearing a bikini and some perfectly normal loose skin is visible, as would be expected from any person who has been pregnant before or who has gone through a change in their weight for whatever reason or any number of other reasons. The caption reads, I have stretch marks and I wear a bikini. I have a belly that's permanently flabby from carrying three giant babies, and I wear a bikini. My belly button is saggy, which is something I didn't even know was possible before, exclamation point, exclamation point, and I wear a bikini. I wear a bikini because I'm proud of this body and every mark on it. Those marks prove that I was blessed enough to carry my babies, and that flabby tummy means I worked so hard to lose what weight I could. Interestingly, there was no mention of the $24,000 boob job that she got two years before to undo some of the pregnancy-related changes to her body. I guess that would be inconsistent with the message of the post, wouldn't it? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with cosmetic surgery, but it certainly casts doubt on the message that you're proud of this body and every mark on it. The post was so viral that the Today Show website, today.com, covered it in an article with what is now kind of a funny headline that shows how much of a nobody she was at the time. And it is, Mom flaunts flab, saggy belly button in viral bikini photo. It's amusing to me that at this time, Rachel is just nameless mom. <laughs> Honestly, in my opinion, that post was never that bold or brave to begin with and could really be quite discouraging to anyone who isn't as fit and slim and pretty as Rachel is, especially with how she basically talks about herself like she's friggin' Quasimodo. 
it's not really a good thing to be self-deprecating like that because what's going to happen is someone who is farther away from the mainstream media pop culture acceptable beauty standards than you are is going to hear you say that about yourself and then extrapolate to think, oh, so what she thinks and everyone else thinks of me must be 10 times worse. Like, oh, wow, a slim young white woman with long hair in a bikini, bold. This is a great example of the curated imperfection that is Rachel's bread and butter, which is pretending to confess to or share something embarrassing or shameful uh, that requires courage to share, when in fact it's not embarrassing in any way that isn't completely trivial and is actually a quite universal experience. Like, oh my God, Rachel's hair is messy when she wakes up. How embarrassing and shameful. My hair is perfect 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You see, it's a very carefully selected set of perfect moments or attributes that she shares. She shared her stretch marks in the bikini photo, but the breast, oh no, she had to have a $24,000 boob job that she, oops, must have forgotten to mention in the caption of that bikini photo. I mean, come on, you gotta be reasonable. There's imperfection and then there's straight up unmentionable, am I right? Be proud of those pregnancy related changes. I mean, <laughs> within reason, ladies. In early 2017, Rachel had the idea of pivoting to motivational speaking and personal development after observing that there were no women in the space that her idols, Tony Robbins and Les Brown, were in. Apparently, no thought was given to perhaps the reasons why there might be no women in that space. But that's all I'm going to say about that. How anyone can idolize a repulsive pile of human garbage like Tony Robbins is beyond me, but whatever. Rachel explained in an interview with ATXWoman.com that, at the time, she had decided to stop doing influencer marketing and sponsored content on her blog in favor of having a more authentic relationship with her audience, stating, That was a big leap for us because that was how we made money, and we didn't even know if there was a way to make money in the arena that we were going into. We weren't really sure how we were going to do it. We just knew we had to. Thus, the first ever RISE conference was held in June 2017 in Austin, Texas, with 250 women in attendance, so I guess we've really come full circle, haven't we? Around this time, she also began to get up at 5 a.m. to write a book until 7 a.m. because if you wake up at 5 a.m., that means you are morally superior to everybody else in literally every way possible at all times. I'm sorry, that's just the way it works. Now, I'm not sure when that late 5 a.m. start got upgraded to a more respectable 4 a.m., but it's great to see what someone with real grit and drive can do, unlike our unpersonally developed asses. You go, Rachel. Uh, this is also when Dave Hollis completely voluntarily left his job of 17 years at Disney to become CEO of the Hollis Company, which Rachel was definitely 100% in favor of. In fact, it was basically her idea other than the fact that it was Dave's idea and he insisted on it on the grounds that if he were to seek future corporate positions, he would, of course, need to be the CEO for a job title, which made something resembling sense at the time. Although now I just have to point out that you actually don't need to have had a CEO job title to be a disorganized, general, aimless internet flailer. So that whole thing may not have been as necessary as we thought in the first place, other than the fact that obviously Dave's career, no matter how hypothetical, is more important than Rachel's little career. See, it's fine. Dave just had to explain the facts and logic to Rachel so that she would understand that she actually doesn't like being a CEO. She thought she liked being a CEO, but luckily she had Dave there to explain it to her so that she would know what's good for her. Ah. In February of 2018, Rachel Hollis threw mega publisher juggernaut HarperCollins under its Christian imprint for reasons that I'm sure are 100% faith-based and 0% for marketing and sales reasons, released, Girl, wash your face. Stop believing the lies about who you are so you can become who you were meant to be. Wow. That title is really something. Everyone forgets that subtitle. Did Dave come up with the title? Why does every book need to be snappy thing, colon, outrageously wordy thing that is basically a summary of the entire book? <sighs> anyway, the point is Rachel Hollis released Girl, Wash Your Face and nobody cared. 
at least at first. The week of March 19th, 2018, Girl Wash Your Face cracked the top 25 of the Publishers Weekly nonfiction bestsellers at number 21, with about 3,600 books sold that week in a total since release of 28,000. Then the week of April 16th, 2018, it jumped to number five on the Publishers Weekly list with weekly sales of almost 9,000 for a total of almost 52,000 books sold. On April 29th, the book first appeared on the New York Times Advice, How To, and Miscellaneous bestseller list at number seven. On the week of June 11th, 2018, after falling briefly to number 10 on Publishers Weekly's nonfiction list, it managed to edge out Nazi sympathizing, climate change denying, white supremacist, fascist Jordan Peterson's utterly brain dead collection of ramblings, 12 Rules for Life, in which he explains that because crustaceans respond differently to serotonin, you just have to accept that men are superior to women in every way and that you are just meant to be poor, okay? And there's just nothing that we can do about it to claim the number six spot, which I believe is something uh, called a hierarchy, isn't it, Jordy boy? The week of July 16th, 2018, Girl Wash Your Face finally hit number one on the list with weekly sales of over 23,000 copies and total sales of just over 206,000. Girl Wash Your Face closed 2018 at number three on the publisher's weekly nonfiction bestseller list with weekly sales of 78,783 and total sales of 1.2 million copies. It would spend a total of 86 weeks on the New York Times advice, how-to, and miscellaneous bestseller list. The second RISE conference would be inexplicably held in Glendale, California, a city which is basically Burbank if it made bad choices. Attendance tripled from the first event rising to over 800 attendees, which is a trend that I'm sure will definitely continue uninterrupted to this day. I don't have too many notes on this one other than the fact that I do not understand this fucking stupid donut board trend. That is disgusting. Donuts are supposed to be moist and it doesn't really take a long time for them to dry out and get stale. That's why they're usually in a closed cabinet or case because the moisture escapes from them pretty quickly. Literally in the time it would take you to remove each donut from the box that it was in for the purpose of keeping it from drying out so that you can showcase your stupidity to Instagram by placing each one on a peg on this board, they would probably be pretty much dried out and horrible. Also, this is outside and all that sugar is going to be pretty appetizing to the bugs. Absolutely repulsive. If you're going to eat something with that much sugar in it, uh, you should probably eat it when it's fresh and moist and delicious, not when it has been sampled by like five yellow jackets and turned dry and crusty. Ew. So stupid. I cannot express how angry this photo makes me. Speaking of things that make me incredibly angry, in September of 2018, Rachel and Dave, who were in year two of three of their marriage falling apart, would host the first Rise Together conference, a conference all about building a strong relationship and marriage with your partner by emulating Rachel and Dave, a couple who will definitely not be getting divorced 626 days later. See, that's what's so refreshing about Rachel. She is so authentic, real, and transparent. She doesn't try to convince you that her life is perfect. She shares the imperfections with you as long as they don't actually matter or preclude her from profiting off of your adoration. Okay, did she and Dave put out years of content about what they did to keep their relationship perfect while they knew they were on a path toward divorce? Sure. Did they charge 200 couples $1,700 for their Rise Together conference, hotel stay not included, where they said they would help other couples get a perfect marriage like theirs, knowing that for at least a year prior, they had been not getting along at all whatsoever? Yeah, but if you're going to use words like facade and deceptive just because their entire relationship was a lie crafted to bring in over $350,000 in revenue per sold out Rise Together event, not to mention the ad sales on the Rise Together podcast, then what? you're just a hater, okay? 
If you were not familiar with the Hollis brand at this time, it's important for me to point out that the reason it was 200 couples was not because 200 couples are how many bought tickets. No, that was the capacity of the event. I cannot emphasize enough how huge every single Hollis company event was at this time and in 2019 and even the beginning of 2020, okay? It's sold out. Now, it needs to be mentioned that since at least 2017, Rachel Hollis had been accused of plagiarism, specifically in Instagram posts where she would feature a quote from another author or influencer without attributing it, or even worse, would put her own name on it. Stephanie McNeil of BuzzFeed News was the first journalist on this case, pointing out six examples of Rachel posting a quote and putting her own name on it when the quote was not her own. For example, here. When you really want something, you'll find a way. When you don't really want something, you'll find an excuse. Quote, Rachel Hollis. No. This quote has been attributed to motivational speaker Jim Rohn, who died in 2009. Additionally, McNeil reported that there had been some controversy about the title that Hollis had recently announced for her upcoming book, Girl Stop Apologizing due to it being suspiciously similar to the title of Professor Maya Yovanovic's 2016 book, Hey Ladies, Stop Apologizing. While this reporting would create an undercurrent of negative sentiment toward Hollis, it would be largely inconsequential and fail to rise into mainstream discussion. In November of 2018, the next RISE conference was announced to be held in June of 2019 in Minneapolis. There were approximately 3,500 tickets available. Those tickets sold out in 27 minutes. That includes 254 VIP tickets sold out at $1,800 each, bringing in $457,000 in revenue from the VIP tickets alone. It also includes well over twice that number in $600 premier tier tickets. The standard general admission ticket was $400 and the downgraded basic level ticket was $200. That's the lowest possible price to get in the door at the RISE conference, $200. For those wanting to attend the dance party, which I mean, how could you miss that? It was an additional $50 charge. That's right. The dance parties at the RISE conference had an additional $50 charge. People actually paid extra to experience that. The event also featured an optional add-on of a health and wellness day, which was held the day before the actual conference for $150 extra, which I must point out is significantly more expensive than any of the tickets to Rachel, if you paid for more, you'd be made for more, Hollis's 2022 tour. That health and wellness add-on was also completely sold out. So all of that sold out in 27 minutes. In March of 2019, Rachel's next book, Girl Stop Apologizing, A Shame-Free Plan for Embracing and Achieving Your Goals, drops, and it is immediately on the New York Times Advice, How To, and Miscellaneous bestseller list, where it would go on to remain for almost 40 weeks. Granted, that's less than half as long as Girl Wash Your Face, but still nothing to sneeze at. Girl Stop Apologizing is all about not apologizing for being ambitious and a woman at the same time. I haven't read it, but I'm going to assume that there's something in there where she explains the difference between apologizing for being ambitious, which you should not do, versus letting your husband push you out of the CEO role at your own company and getting you to agree that it's because he totally needs it. And besides, you didn't actually want the CEO role. You only thought you did, which is something that you should do. That is completely okay, okay? What else was she supposed to do? Tell him, no, this is my company, and if you can't handle me being the CEO, then you can't handle working with me, and so maybe you should stay at Disney and go away and reflect on why you don't actually respect me as the leader of my own company? <laughs> she can't do that. He might get mad at her, okay? Girls, stop apologizing. Unless not apologizing will make a man in your life mad. Then apologize. Okay, I promise it's not as bad as it sounds, or maybe it is. I haven't read it, remember? Due to the Minneapolis Rise Conference selling out so quickly, they added a second event in Dallas to meet demand. The Dallas Rise Conference was a two-day event 
held at the nearly 7,000 seat Curtis Colwell Center in Dallas. And just like the Minneapolis event, the tickets started at $200 for the most basic general admission ticket with a $400 and $600 tier also available for general admission. All tiers of tickets were completely sold out. Once again, for the true Rachel Hollis stands who paid for more to be made for more, there was the $1,800 VIP package, which also sold out completely within days. Don't worry, the VIP package includes the dance party at no extra fee because as we all know, Rachel is so generous. I just want to really drive home that there was once a time when Rachel Hollis sold out events with 7,000 tickets ranging from $200 to $1,800 and a $50 dance party add-on in addition to a $150 extra day. But that's not all. 2019 was a very big year for the Hollis company. 2019 was peak Hollis. It was the top of the mountain. The final Rise event of the year was the all new Rise Business Conference, which was held in Charleston, South Carolina, with speakers, of course, including Rachel Hollis, Dave Hollis, convicted real estate scammer Dean Graziosi, sugar bar shiller Tom Bilyeu, professional liar and personal net worth inflator Ed Milet, and many more of their fellow self-help personal development circle jerk participants. Tickets for this flim flam fest started at $300 for you literal trash who don't get up at 4 a.m. who shouldn't even be here, but Rachel and Dave are charitably allowing you to attend for only $300 and ranged up to $1,800 for the VIP package, which thank God included a photo op with Rachel and Dave, a photo which I'm sure those VIP attendees still cherish and treasure to this very day. There were 6,000 tickets available and the event was completely sold out. 2020 would open for the Hollis Company with RISE conferences in Fort Myers, Florida, and Toronto, sorry Canada, in January and March respectively. Both events featured the same lineup of tickets and pricing as the 2019 conferences and both events were sold out. The Toronto RISE conference would be the last live true RISE event. Also in March of 2020, Dave Hollis would release Get Out of Your Own Way, which would hit number three on the New York Times Advice, How To, and Miscellaneous list in the first week of sales before dropping to number eight and off the list entirely two weeks later, which apparently would set something of an expectation in his mind. That wasn't the only disaster to happen in March of 2020, though. As we all know, this is when the COVID-19 pandemic really began to accelerate in the United States and elsewhere. It was very strange how rapidly the tone switched between like March 10th and March 17th. <laughs> oh, and I turned 30 and Salt Lake City had an earthquake. Man, that was a weird month. Rachel and Dave, like many public figures and other influencers, began posting extremely cringy quarantine content, helpfully informing us in an April 30th Rise Together podcast episode that dating your spouse and having regular makeout sessions is really helping them out, which is excellent advice from a couple who will certainly be together longer than another 38 days. There was supposed to be a Rise conference in San Diego for May of 2020, which obviously was not going to happen with the COVID-19 pandemic, so it was hilarious variously rescheduled for August of 2020, by which time the COVID-19 pandemic would of course be a distant memory. <laughs> so instead there was a virtual RISE conference. In fact, let's take a look at this video announcing it that certainly portends a couple who will be together forever. Wait a minute, it's 8-11. What is happening? It is way early for the Why are we starting so show. soon? We got a- It's we got, not nine o'clock. We got a busy day. We've got a lot going on. I'm doing some webinars today. I'm doing some podcasts today. We've got a team meeting this team morning. Meeting. So we had to fit it in right now. Here we are. We're Here coming we are. in early, better early coming than in not hot. at all. Oh, is my is my earplug? Where's right? your earplug, You're honey? Very loud. I'm very excited about Tuesday. I don't know where I'm oh got it. Got it. We're gonna be fine in one minute. Get Here the earplug in. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. Guys, get ready. What are, we, what are we ready for? Get ready. For? Prepare your hearts. Oh, I know. Okay, two things you might find unbelievable. One, there was a time when people didn't find that incredibly obnoxious, apparently. And this was actually still a successful event by all accounts. Although certainly not as much of a smash hit as the live events. One blogger whose account I read in researching this wrote, I love how relatable Rachel always is in a post gushing about the Rise virtual event.
It would not be a complete account of this event, however, to cover it without mentioning that in her promotional posts about the event, the Maya Angelou quote, and still I rise, was posted on Instagram without attributing it to her. This sparked outrage far beyond that of any earlier plagiarism controversy, as it was an especially egregious offense to have a wealthy white woman appropriating the words of a black woman without attribution, specifically in service of promoting a self-help conference largely aimed at other wealthy white women that was sure to be highly profitable for Hollis. In her so-called apology, Rachel would blame her team in what had become, at this point, a bit of a tiresome pattern for her. A baffling attempt to shift blame, given that, if true, it suggests that Rachel Hollis is incompetent at hiring a team, created a work culture in which plagiarism was acceptable, is a terrible leader, or is just a liar, but it's probably all of the above. June 8th of 2020, Rachel Hollis announces the following. Guys, I have some hard news to share, and the honest truth is, I have no idea how someone announces something like this, so I'm just going to say it. Dave and I have made the incredibly difficult decision to end our marriage. We started out as best friends 18 years ago. Rachel, you started off as a booty call, but whatever. And the truth is that core friendship and the parts of us that work so well have become a band-aid for the parts of us that don't. We have worked endlessly over the last three years to make this work and have come to the conclusion that it is healthier and more respectful for us to choose this as the end of our journey as a married couple. We remain dear friends as we raise our family as co-parents and run our company as partners. We are choosing joy, even though, I'll be honest, the last month has been one of the most awful of our lives. It's almost like choosing joy is toxic positivity, isn't it? I want to be strong and bold and optimistic for you now, but every ounce of my energy is reserved in being those things for my children. You can be honest with your children, you know. That said, having been such an open book to this beloved community, we hope that you can allow us a human moment. We hope you can understand our need to process these changes away from social media. It's a little bit ridiculous to ask that when you made your relationship a selling point on your social media, frankly. We graciously ask that you respect our privacy so we can focus on what matters most, our four kids in the next chapter of what our family looks like now. This was explosive. Personally, I always thought that they would eventually get divorced. They just seemed so fake. And based on everything that was in Girl Wash Your Face, it didn't seem like they had much to keep them together. Let me be clear. Rachel absolutely received the brunt of the hatred because misogyny. And that was happening even before Dave cunningly made his own little announcement on July 26th of 2020, which essentially served as a magnifying glass to really focus the hate on her and direct it away from him in the process. Quote, I put this picture up on our anniversary in May, then took it down two days later. It was our 16th, a year from this shot renewing our vows, married a fourth time after ceremonies every five years, one of the best days ever. Two days later, Ray told me that she didn't want to be married anymore, that I could only become the man and she the woman we were each truly meant to be apart. So the post with memories we'd make left me embarrassed for a vision of a future that wasn't shared. I'll always love her, cheer for her, and now pray every single day that she's right, becoming something greater, even if it's so sad. To that I say, what a manipulative little thing to write, you absolute sleazeball of a man. You knew exactly what you were doing, weaponizing your social media following that you built leeching off of hers to direct a bunch of hate at her. Gross. However, frustratingly, Rachel would later seem to lump all of this in the same basket as the very legitimate criticism of how much of the Hollis Company's brand and business had been built off of a deceptive representation of their relationship as being strong, when in fact, it had been in shambles since at least seven months prior to the publication of Girl, Wash Your Face, through the entire run of the Rise Together podcast, and... Notably, during the planning, promotion, and execution of the Relationship Counseling Rise Together Conference, whose 
whose registration page was opened to accept the credit cards of struggling, desperate couples around the time when Dave and Rachel's marriage was entering its 13th consecutive month of dysfunction, according to Rachel. It's unclear if perhaps some additional makeout sessions would have prevented it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. See, Rachel and Dave's problems are real problems, unlike yours. Your problems are shit that you just need to choose joy and stop complaining about, okay? Oh, grr. great. I simply cannot cover Rachel Hollis's 2020 without mentioning that she had a show on Quibi. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Do you not remember Quibi? Quibi was the new streaming platform with a concept that definitely would have been a massive success if it weren't for COVID-19 and also the fact that the idea behind it was the most categorically moronic demonstration of the complete and utter ignorance possessed by terminally out-of-touch media company executives. Remember how shocking it was when Quibi shut down after a matter of months? It was like, wow, I can't believe that was not an unprecedented smash hit success. I mean, you could watch the video in portrait or landscape, which is something that we were, of course, all clamoring for. September 29th of 2020, Rachel would release Didn't See That Coming. Putting life back together when your world falls apart, proving that the vague short title, colon, long ass spelling it out for you title trend is definitely here to stay for better or for worse, and I'm here to say it is for the worse. <laughs> the book would launch at number two on the New York Times advice how to and miscellaneous bestseller list, which would be its highest rank. It would spend a total of six weeks on the list, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at, but nowhere close to girl stop apologizing, let alone girl wash your face. It still did better than Get Out of Your Own Way, though, so I guess that's something. This was by far the worst received of any of her books, and while sales were not abysmal, this is where big cracks truly began to form in her audience's perception of her. It's also worth noting that a lot of people bought the book hoping that it would have the tea on the divorce, which it definitely did not. Many reviewers felt that it sounded incredibly out of touch and like Rachel was attempting to force in references to the pandemic that were shallow and lacked perspective on the challenges and hardships that many were facing and that it was arrogant and ignorant for her to posture herself as someone uniquely equipped to grapple with the pandemic. Around my 31st birthday, Rachel Hollis posted the following TikTok video. Doing a live stream and I mentioned that there's a sweet woman who comes to my house twice a week and cleans. She's my, my house cleaner. She cleans the toilets. Someone commented and said, you are privileged AF. And I was like, you're right. I'm super freaking privileged, but also I worked my ass off to have the money to have someone come twice a week and clean my toilets. And I told her that. And then she said, well, you're unrelatable. <gasps> what is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable? No, sis, literally everything I do in my life is to live a life that most people can't relate to. Most people won't work this hard. Most people won't get up at 4 a.m. Most people won't fail publicly again and again just to reach the top of the mountain. Literally every woman I admire in history was unrelatable. If my life is relatable to most people, I'm doing it wrong. And the caption read, Harriet Tubman, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Marie Curie, Oprah Winfrey, Amelia Earhart, Frida Kahlo, Malala Yousafzai, and Wu Zetian, all unrelatable AF. Conveniently failing to understand that most of those women, in fact, are quite relatable to many, and that's part of what makes them so inspiring. Thanks, Rachel. At least it was a better birthday gift than Get Out of Your Own Way was. This was absolutely surreal. It was so utterly bizarre to hear someone who built their entire brand and following on relatability ask, what is it about me that makes you think I want to be relatable? If there is a more absurd thing for Rachel Hollis to have said, I'm not sure what that would be. But also, it wasn't just the post itself and its unbelievably brain-meltingly ignorant caption that made it such a death blow to Rachel's reputation. It was also the fact that she left the post up for four days while the backlash erupted. On April 4th, she issued the following Notes app pseudo-apology. Day I'll learn. Not yet, apparently, but someday I'll learn. 
Someday I'll learn that my intent and my impact can be wildly different things. I made a post last week that was upsetting to people, and even though that was never my intent, I own that it was, and I apologize. Was my post upsetting because I said I have someone who cleans my house twice a week? I've talked a lot about this over the years. I have a nanny, I have someone who helps with cleaning, I have a team at work who helps build this business, and I think it's crucial that I keep talking about it. I could very easily pretend that I don't have any assistance. I'm sure it would make my brand more likable and certainly more relatable if I act like I achieve all of these things through hard work and organization, but that's bullshit. You don't have to have a clean house or help with your kids or a business with 25 employees, but if you see those things in my life and wonder how they got there, I want you to know that it's a group effort. A whole village, in fact. Was my post upsetting because I mentioned some of my favorite women in history? This one is even harder for me because... Those women are the most badass I could think of. Someone on my team said, I think people believe you're comparing yourself to them. Comparing myself to the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first and only female monarch in the history of China, to the most inspiring woman in American history who freed herself and then risked her life repeatedly to lead others out of slavery, there is no comparison. To believe that because I mentioned them, I am comparing myself to them is ludicrous. Do I aspire to be as brave? as fierce, to live my life on my own terms, and hopefully inspire other women to do the same? Hell yes, but I cannot now or ever compare myself to these women, and I don't want to. I don't want to try and be the next fill in the blank. I'd like to try and be the first me. That was where things started, but because I still haven't learned, I didn't respond to those things on Friday when I heard that people were upset. I listened to my team instead of my gut. I listened when they told me not to respond to let it blow over. I listened when they said they would monitor the situation, which meant monitor comments. I woke up this morning to find that certain comments had been muted on my post, including some by Rachel Cargill and Lovey, who are both women I admire so much, and if they want to tell me and the world I fucked up with something, we should listen. And you miss the point, like the deserts miss the rain. I've covered this extensively before, so we'll do this quickly, okay? Number one, the point is the way you talked about your housekeeper, not the fact that you had one. Two, yes, you did compare yourself to those women, which is objectively insane. Three, stop blaming your team. You are the leader. You are responsible for literally everything your team does. You hired the team, you trained the team, you created the culture the team works in. Your team's actions are your actions by proxy. A good leader credits their team for successes and takes the fall for the missteps. If you are not prepared to accept responsibility for your team, then don't hire one. That non-apology somehow remained up for a couple more days, until finally the following post was uploaded to the Rachel Hollis Instagram page. I'm not going to do this perfectly, but I'm going to speak from my heart. I'm so deeply sorry for the things I said in my recent posts and the hurt I have caused in the past few days. I know I've caused tremendous pain in mentioning prominent women, including several women of color, whose struggles and achievements I can't possibly understand. By talking about my own success, I diminished the struggles and hard work of many people who work tirelessly every day, disregarded the people whose hard work doesn't afford them financial security, often due to inherently racist and biased systems. I did not allow space for people to voice their anger, hurt, and disappointment, which caused even more pain. I acknowledge my privilege and the advantage I have as a white woman, no matter how I grew up. There are many things I would like to say to reiterate just how sorry I am, but the important thing for me to do now, something I should have already done, is honestly to be quiet and listen. I know I have disappointed so many people, myself included, and I take full accountability. I am so sorry. Uh to say that this was too little, too late would be a massive understatement. This second apology came nearly an entire week after the original TikTok post and two days later after the first disastrous non-apology. For many of her fans, it didn't matter what she said in this second apology. There was nothing she could have said to undo the damage. This wasn't a case of, I'm upset about something Rachel Hollis said and she needs to do better. 
this was a case of Rachel Hollis is not at all who I thought she was. Many public figures have had a bad day or said something offensive and been called out and recovered from it. This was not just saying something offensive. There were several aggravating factors that made this series of events a decisive moment for many fans. Number one, in the video, the rhetorical question, what is it about me that makes you think I want to be relatable? On top of verging on gaslighting, this question was rather insulting to fans who started following her because they felt she was relatable. It was like she was saying, see, I fooled you idiots. Her entire brand was built on relatability, and now she's saying this? Two, the look in her eyes in the video was very disturbing to many fans and revealed a side of her that really couldn't be unseen. And then three, the fact that the video stayed up for five days and then was followed by a non-apology doubling down on its content made it clear that this wasn't just something that came out wrong or that she didn't really mean. No, she had multiple nights of sleep between the post and the first non-apology, then two nights to sleep on that non-apology, suggesting that she really strongly believes what she said and genuinely does not see why what she said is a problem. And the work required to cross that chasm will best case take years. If the second apology had come out within a few hours of the original post, she probably could have salvaged it, but leaving it up for four days and then doubling down indicates that these are very strongly and deeply held beliefs. Even worse for Rachel, there was supposed to be a Rise Weekend event the following month in May of 2021. This was postponed to September 2021 after the majority of the guest speakers on the program dropped out of the event in response to the event now dubbed Toilet Gate, which is a term that continues to bring me so much joy. The word Toilet Gate is how I choose joy. This event had been planned and marketed as a live event to be held in Austin. While exact numbers were never made public, the Ticketmaster page for the event throughout the summer showed nearly 1,800 tickets available for purchase out of a total of just over 2,000 tickets. This was a disaster. This was completely unprecedented for a Rise event. So what do you do? You blame it on the Delta, blame it on the COVID. All remaining unsold seats were suddenly marked as unavailable and the event was rebranded as a hybrid virtual event. See, it looks like there's nobody there, but actually they're all just watching it online. In fact, they're watching it online with my really, really, really hot boyfriend who um, goes to a different school uh, in Canada. So it might seem like I don't have a date to the prom, but it's really because my really, really, really hot boyfriend goes to a different school in Canada. Right, Rach? No, I'm just kidding. I didn't have a date to the prom because that was most certainly prohibited at my public high school 14 years ago. Not that it mattered because I was not out because it was not safe, a state of affairs, which I'm sure has changed since I was there. I mean, I'm sure it's changed back, but if Republicans say they'll lower your taxes, who gives a fuck, am I right? Anyway, returning from that tangent, there were about 50 to 70 live attendees for this RISE event. That's right, a RISE event, a Rachel Hollis event. I highly doubt there were very many last minute sales of the virtual tickets. Remember, these events used to sell out thousands of tickets, starting at $200 and ranging to $1,800 in less than half an hour. Now, most people, and by most people, I mean those of us who won't get up at 4 a.m. because we are absolute fucking trash, would have learned something from that train wreck and realized we were not going to be selling tickets like we used to anymore. Uh, but not our girl, Rachel, suck it till you fuck it, Hollis. After remaining relatively low-key on social media other than posting her Rage Talk video series and releasing podcast episodes during the first half of 2022, on May 23rd, Rachel Hollis announces that she is going on tour. I was completely blindsided by this, not from the information or the announcement itself, but from the number of assumptions I had been operating under for the past eight months that this announcement had just shattered. See, this entire time, I had been under the impression that she was, at least since the failed Rise 2021, aware of the extensive and re irreparable damage done by Toilet Gate. I figured she might have been unaware up to the conversion of the September 2021 event from a live to a virtual event, but she definitely had to have realized it after that catastrophe, right? Right? I mean, at the time, she blamed 
the dismal in-person sales numbers on COVID-19. But this whole time, I had figured that was just what they were saying. I didn't think that they actually believed that. And as if the idea of Rachel Hollis going on tour in 2022 weren't ludicrous enough on its own, she also had a very perplexing overall concept for the tour. So it was very unequivocally not going to be a Rise conference, okay? This is going to be the Rage Talk Live tour, which sounds like a completely insane idea to me. How is she going to be so funny live on stage? She's not even funny in the Rage Talk YouTube videos, which have cuts every five to 10 seconds, which you can't do on stage. I don't have any evidence to back this up, but after a month or so, the tour was rebranded completely from being a casual Rage Talk discussion that was most certainly not the Rise Conference to simply the Rachel Hollis Live Tour, which would, from what I can determine, pretty much be the Rise Conference. My hypothesis is that after a month of nearly non-existent ticket sales, our girl still failing to realize the extent of the toilet gate catastrophe had the insane idea that perhaps it was the fact that it was a Rage Talk live tour that was keeping people from buying tickets. Surely, if she changed it to being the Rachel Hollis Mini Rise Conference, that would bring in the sales, right? Well, there were 11 cities. Here's the estimated totals, as laboriously tabulated by the r slash Hollis Uncensored subreddit. That's approximately 3,300 tickets sold from roughly 27,000 total, or about 12% of capacity. Let me remind you that in 2019, they sold out a 3,500 ticket event in 27 minutes for a single city, and they would sell out 6,000 and 7,000 ticket events later that same year, all of which cost $200 at the very minimum. In fact, the 6,000 ticket event was the Rise Business Conference held in Charleston, South Carolina, where just 291 tickets out of 2,500 sold for the tour. None of the Rage Talk tour tickets cost over $100, and most were around $30. That's embarrassing. Well, I'm sure this was a difficult, incredibly painful, but very valuable learning experience for her. You know, sometimes it takes an absolute thrashing for us to accept a discomforting, dismaying truth. So Rachel, why don't you go ahead and talk to us through the reasons that this was such a failure and what you're going to do about Toilet Gate going forward? Let's see. This one says, okay, she has a question about tour. Hey, Rachel, I just noticed that you are not touring in Columbus. So I was just curious as to if you're okay and um, if you're going to be at anywhere close to there. I was really looking forward to it. I listen to you pretty much every day. And uh, yeah, so if you have the opportunity to let other people know on your podcast uh, what happened, I would really just like to know um, what happened, I guess. And I hope that you're okay. All right, thanks. Oh my gosh. First of all, love that. I literally, I probably should call her name is Erica. I probably should call her and like freak her out and be like, hey, it's Rach. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, there were a couple cities that came off the tour schedule and it's nothing to worry about. So first I will answer Erica specifically and say she said she was in Columbus. Um, so I hope Erica, you'll come to the Cincinnati show. So there are actually two in Ohio. And I know it's not in the exact same place, but it is in the same state. So maybe you roll over and hang out with me there. And I believe Cincinnati's our last night. So I feel like that's going to be the most epic. Like it'll be this big build up to that last night. So hopefully you can come hang out with us there. But yeah, the, it's not it's not controversial or dramatic. It was like a little bit of a bummer. But this whole tour is an experiment. I've never done it before. We're going to cities that are not known for personal development. I think I've said this pretty publicly that, you know, it was intentional if – I had gone to Miami, LA, Manhattan, like there are places I could go that I know would be a bigger draw. Uh, just, you know, people there maybe have gone to something like this before and would want to come see. And in this instance, we were trying out cities to see if there was nibbles there. And some cities, it just wasn't as popular. And people are like, oh, my, you know, what? Are, and I was like, oh, it's okay. It's not a big, you know, I think probably those the incredible team that has been working on tour with me i think that they probably were worried about 
my ego and like, oh, what are you going to do? And I'm like, oh, I still can't believe that literally one person wants to pay to hear me speak. Oh, thank God. Same. (laughs) See, I thought that you didn't feel the same way, but I'm so glad that we're on the same page. But also, Manhattan, are you out of your fucking mind? Manhattan. Manhattan. Why would anyone in Manhattan buy a ticket to see someone that they've never heard of? So this tour is experimental cities that aren't into personal development. Then riddle me this, Rachel. How the fuck did the 2019 Rise Business Conference in not into personal development, Charleston, South fucking Carolina, sell out a 6,000 seat arena? If you were going to deploy this excuse, maybe you should have been smart enough to not return to a city that already hosted a sold out Rise Conference so that you wouldn't look like a stuck up narcissist in denial when your 2022 tour date there can't even sell 300 tickets for a tenth of the price. Let me explain something to you, Rach. As someone who was born and raised in the Great Lakes Midwest and then spent his 20s half in Los Angeles and half in New England, This condescending attitude is a terrible idea for two reasons. Number one, people in Manhattan do not know who you are. People in Los Angeles, if they know who you are, only know because you were involved in Hollywood via Dave and Sheik events, not as a personal development scammer. Trust me, none of those people want to be associated with you anymore. It would destroy their reputation and nobody else in Los Angeles knows who the fuck you are. Seriously, get real. Who do you think you are? Number two. You will only get the chance to talk down to the Midwest once. They will not give you a second opportunity to talk down to them. That region got culturally and economically backstabbed and betrayed by every company, politician, sports team, organization, everything at every turn over and over for like the past 50 years. And the rest of the country responds by making it a punchline and punching bag. So there's an often unspoken but always very real and visceral level of rage and resentment and defensiveness, a lot of it justified, somewhere deep down in the sort of population level consciousness of the folks that call the Midwest and especially the Great Lakes region their home. So when you condescend to the people of a region that has been relentlessly economically and culturally battered by the country as a whole for like 50 years, They detect it immediately. They will want absolutely nothing to do with you. They will remember it forever. And I promise you, there is no place that serenely holds a soft, seething, bloodthirsty grudge like the Great Lakes region. So you'll end up with nobody because this attitude isn't going to make anybody on the urban east or west coasts know who you even are. And the Midwest would just hate for such an esteemed, important woman with a jam-packed social calendar of exclusive Manhattan soirees waste her time on charity for them. For real. Like, I have never lost that version of me that, I mean, I learned to be a keynote speaker. No bullshit. I learned to be a keynote speaker by volunteering at senior citizens' homes, by talking at the local library. Like, I would go speak at the opening of an envelope. I would go to anything because I was just trying to work on how to be a better speaker. I can very easily tap into what it feels like to not have anybody know your name and not have anybody care what you were saying. So the fact that thousands of you have bought tickets to tour is like, my heart's exploding. And y'all know what's going on. You know the price of gas, you know inflation, you know all of these things. And just in the world that we're living in, as much as I would freaking love to show up, you know, for a few hundred people, just like, I couldn't do that. Because in this instance, we have a partner in every city who helps us to put on the show. So there's like a local promoter in every city. And if they commit to something like that, it could be financially really harmful for them. I mean, think about it. Like if they put on a theater and turn on the lights and sell the tickets and do whatever and not enough people show up, they could lose money. And this is just post-COVID. It's not an environment where I want to do that, especially in small towns. So did she just refer to the 14th largest city in the United States as a small town? 
Ma'am, Columbus is the largest city in the seventh most populous state. Are you out of your fucking mind? No. People didn't buy tickets because they are no longer fans of you, mostly because of Toilet Gate, but in this region, for anyone who heard this podcast episode, it'll be Toilet Gate and this podcast episode where you exposed yourself to be a condescending, ignorant poser who looks down her nose at those who took her to her peak. Obviously, she has learned nothing, despite the obvious lesson staring her right in the face. I bet she still does not get it, and I'm starting to think that she never will. If she actually believes those are the real reasons this tour failed so completely and not Toilet Gate, she is delusional and in denial, simple as. Rachel, for the love of God, read the room, take a hint. The reason people did not attend the tour is not because they couldn't afford it or didn't have time or because your team picked experimental cities like the Columbus metro area, a small town of 2.2 million people and famously not into personal development nor Rachel Hollis. It is because they didn't want to, because they don't like you, because you revealed yourself to be a mean, arrogant, stuck-up, out-of-touch, privileged, two-faced, ignorant, dishonest, airheaded charlatan with absolutely nothing of value to say. And all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put your image together again. It is over. You had your rise. This was your fall. And now winter is coming, so get off the mountain and get out of the way. I, if you'll excuse me, have got to go sharpen my skis. I've been Mac. Peace out. Bye!